You're listening to Tim Bolkley's 5-Minute Bible. Several of the things that I've been doing or reading recently have caused me to think about the way in which our presuppositions and what we're trying to do with biblical texts impacts on how we understand them and often warps and twists how we understand them. I came across an example of it just today. I'm looking through the fine book Grasping God's Word by Duval and Hayes about a hands-on approach to reading, interpreting and applying the Bible. It's a superb book and we're planning to use it for our in understanding and interpreting the Bible course next year. But at one point they make a mistake. They're talking about the biblical author's background and they say consider Amos a prophet who preached around 760 BC. Though Amos was from Tekoa in the Judah, the southern kingdom, God called him to preach in Israel, the northern kingdom. Amos says about himself, I was neither a prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a shepherd, and I took care of sycamore fig trees. Amos 7.14 And they go on, Amos was not being paid to be a prophet, nor was he following in his dad's footsteps. The prophetic task was completely new to him, and so on. Now, in essence, they're right. But that phrase, nor was he following in his dad's footsteps, is simply wrong. There is no place that I can find in the Bible where son and prophet go together in such a way that you're understanding the meaning to be that so-and-so is the son of a prophet. The, the prophet is the father. In every place where I come across the phrase, son of a prophet, or sons of the prophets, or anything like it, it seems quite clear to me that what's being talked about are those bunches of prophetic enthusiasts who went around as gangs. You remember the ones that Saul joins in 1 Samuel chapter 10. The ones that uh, Elijah and Elisha train up later on in the book of Kings. Son of a prophet means a member of one of those gangs or guilds of prophets. So what's going on with Duval and Hayes that they misunderstand? Because surely they know that. At the very least, J. Daniel Hayes, who's an Old Testament specialist, must know it. It's not a new or a abstruse fact. And anyway, it's one they could have checked simply by looking it up in the Bible. What I think is going on is that they're doing what we often do and letting our rhetoric carry us away. They're keen on the idea they're expressing that Amos isn't paid to be a prophet, that Amos is called by God to be a prophet, and he's called from being something else. And it seems logical enough to express that, among other ways, by saying that he isn't following in his dad's footsteps. It fits with most cultures. But it's not what Amos 7.14 says. Incidentally, I think that the NIV mistranslates Amos 7.14 by rendering it in the past. I wasn't a prophet. It's not what Amos says. It's quite clear in the Hebrew. Lo navi anuchi. I'm not a prophet. Present tense. Because there's no tense, there's no verb. And where there's no ver verb, there's almost always only a present tense involved. I'm not a prophet. No prophet me. Mind you, that's difficult, since Amos is clearly prophesying right, left and centre, and even his opponent Amos Sire in chapter 7 recognises that he prophesies. So the NIV, not wanting the Bible to seem to fail to make sense, corrects it and puts a past tense. So, in the one little passage, one verse, two examples of how we let our interests and rhetoric get the better of us and misrepresent the Bible. Of course, it's not just the NIV translators or Duval and Hayes. I do it too. We all do it. So when you're reading what we write, you need to read critically and watch out for where we've let our rhetoric run away with us. It really is a good book, Duval and Hayes. 
I recommend you get it if you haven't looked at it already. Bye for now.